ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's March 22nd, 2022. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Kanesport.com. Joined, as always, by our managing editor, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day, presented by LifeWallet, where the time is now to take charge of your personal health. And, uh, Matt, I fought my way back from Greenville uh, quite a weekend. I got to tell you, you know, I've been covering the Canes for a long time, as you and every most people know. And uh, this was one of the special weekends. It really was. Uh, just the way it all came together and the way Miami performed on the basketball court up there yesterday, the way the kids handled themselves, um, just all a very interesting experience. Um, but now the slate is clean again. Uh, it's Sweet 16 time, and everybody's on a level playing field that has survived to this point. And the Canes are going to have to come back down to earth and do it all again next weekend in Chicago. And we'll uh, we'll be talking about that all week for sure. But now it's time to give ourselves back to the, the purists on our website and in the Canes Nation um, who, who follow us for all these years. And um, spring practice is cranking back up uh, this morning. And uh, this is going to be an interesting week, Matt, because uh, we talked about it. You had new, new coaches coaching new players for the f- first time last week, feeling their way, installing new, new systems and things like that. Well, this morning, the full pads come on. And uh, to me, this is the the real start of spring practice. Uh, The indoctrination has taken place now. uh, And the coaches had a week, Matt, to look at everything that went on out there in the first week. Now they have a better feel for their players, what they can do, what they can't do. I guarantee you, knowing Mario Cristobal, they have spent dozens of hours in the last week looking at film, discussing what happened the first week. And I expect the intensity to be amped up starting this morning. Yeah, well, I mean, a source told me that the entire staff took a vacation to the Bahamas over the entire week. So, oh, wait, that was wrong staff. My bad. Uh, Yeah, we'll find out. I mean, the first week of spring practice, you never see a lot. There's no pads, no nothing. So I really just want, I hope they let us see some of the 11 on 11 with pads on. Otherwise, it's a waste of our time. So hopefully Mario Cristobal Let's us out there um, because that's that's what you have to see if you're a reporter. It's hard to tell when kids are just running basic drills. I and mean, you can tell if they pass the eye test, which is what we reported the first week. So I'm hoping this week we can see some new things and be able to bring you guys a lot more detail. Um, you know, certainly we can see the depth charts and things like that. But, you know, that's always, you know, moving around this time of year anyway. So really I want to see mainly how, see how the offensive line looks. Inside run drill. You know, full pads inside line drill. We'll learn a lot. Yeah, that would be great. If, to be if we can see. watch it, if we're allowed to watch it. It would be great <laughs> to see that. I, I agree. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's been talked about a lot on our message boards, as usual, because it's the most high profile position on the football team, and that's the quarterback situation. And um, some guys have, you know, been a little bit, um, I'll say rattled by um, – I, I guess you've been joining me a little bit on this. We, we've been talking pretty highly of Jake Garcia and the way that he came off the injury, the way he's looked in the early days of practice. Uh, to my eye, there has not been a discernible difference in the drills that we've seen between the quarterbacks. I, I think they're both doing fine. And, um, you know, obviously they really get put to the test when things go full speed, and full pads. But... Uh, Nobody's here. I, I think you will agree with me, Matt. We're not suggesting that Jake Garcia is going to start over Tyler Van Dyke. I mean, you know, that just doesn't make any sense when you look at the body of work that Tyler put together the second half of last year. Why would you not, even with a new coaching staff coming in, why would you not start with Tyler Van Dyke in September? Um, you know, I don't think any of us are saying that. Um, what we are saying is that Jake Garcia's mission this spring is to give the coaches something to think about in terms of giving him playing time. Because remember, when he got hurt last fall, he and Tyler Van Dyke were splitting reps pretty much 50-50. 
This this was not a decided quarterback race. Jake Garcia was right there with Tyler. And so, Matt, um, his onus this spring, and it kicks into overdrive today, is like I said, to convince Josh Gaddis and Mario Cristobal, hey, man, I'm right there with Tyler, and let me play. I I just don't think that I'm ready to say that – listen, everyone wants Tyler Van Dyke to start because what he did last season. But I'm a big proponent of you bringing a new staff, a new quarterbacks coach, a new system. What if the other guy's better? You know, I mean, this is something that goes back to Howard Schnellenberg. You don't just play a guy because, you know, he did something that you liked in one year or a few games. You, you know, Tyler Van – look, Tyler Van Dyke had a great end of the season. He wasn't great those first two games if – he played if, if Jake Garcia hadn't been hurt, who's to know if Jake Garcia might not be the guy everyone's saying. So I'm going to leave it up to the Miami coaches. I'm not going to say, Oh, Tyler Van Dyke's definitely starting. Like I'm not the one who's here saying Jake Garcia should start or looks great. I don't think either of them have looked anything special. It's three practices. Neither of them look any good. They're throwing five yard passes. It's I mean, clear, neither one of us has said that. I mean, we've been missing. Well, I don't know who you're referring to. I don't really, I don't listen to the outside noise like you, Gary. I just report what no, I see. I mean, and... listen, I mean, we're all a family and, you know, especially, you know, those that are on our website. And if somebody, you know, makes a post or has an opinion or something, I take it seriously. And if they're misrepresenting you or I, I like to clear it up pretty quickly. And in this case, I think you and I were being misrepresented. I mean, we have not said that Jake Garcia should start over Tyler Van Dyke. What we have said is what I just said a minute ago, that Jake yeah. Garcia is doing very well. And he, he, what he's trying to do is show the coaches I deserve to play too. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I think I think fans read into stuff when when you don't say Tyler Van Dyke's the definite starter. Fans think, oh, you know, maybe he's saying Jake Garcia should be the starter. That's why maybe fans think that. I haven't read these posts that you're reading. I don't, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Certainly, neither of us have ever said Jake Garcia should be the starter or will be the starter. But I have no problem if he is the starter. If he is the starter, that's because the coaches think he's better. Like that's what spring practice and fall practice is about. If fans want to twist that as me saying Jake Garcia is going to be the starter, I'm not saying that. I think Tyler Van Dyke had an amazing end of the season last year. I think he um, deserves to be the starter based on that as long as he's at least equal to Jake Garcia in spring and fall because he has the experience edge also. Good, good programs have multiple quarterbacks. Good programs recruit good quarterbacks every single year. This is not unusual. Look at what happened at Oklahoma last year. Uh, they switched quarterbacks. And it worked out very well for them. Uh, look at what used to go on at Alabama with um, when they had Jalen Hurts and uh, Tua. Uh, same thing. They they both played. They went back and forth. One one moment Jalen Hurts was the quarterback, and next minute Tua was the quarterback. Uh, both have gone on to do very well um, for themselves in in terms of making money in the National Football League. Uh, so get used to it because. If this program recruits at the level that I think it's going to recruit at, then you're going to see position battles like this at almost every spot on the roster. And I think you're going to see it at running back this year. I, I think, you know, Jalen Knighton needs to tighten up. You know, I mean, you know, there's not going to be any room for the off the field let ups and stuff of, of the past and, and, and things like that. I mean, Henry Parrish is coming in a, a legit, contender for you know for, for playing time i don't think there's any question about it um you know and then you got uh you know citizen coming in in the fall so uh yeah i mean you're gonna see competition you're gonna see intense competition at most positions as this coaching staff moves forward and i wouldn't get too emotionally attached to any one guy that would be the advice i would give the fans uh to where if you see an opinion that might go contrary to what you believe, uh, don't get rattled by it. Because if we're giving you an opinion like that, it's because we're seeing it out there at practice or we're hearing it, um, you know, in through different uh, avenues um, that we have of covering the program. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what I was saying that. So how it uh, winds back to practice today, Matt, is I think the coach is going to be looking to amp up the competition at every single spot on the field, not just quarterback. I mean, that's every spring practice. But, you know, it's interesting, a quarterback, like if you watch, this is the kind of things that Miami coaches have to deal with, right? So Ja'Curry Brown comes in, and he's, you know, I, I think if if Tyler Van Dyke's the starter, as I think most people expect, I expect that to be the case, then, and, and if he goes to the NFL, which I think a lot of people think he might after this year, then it's going to be 
right? Jake Garcia against Shakuri Brown. So guess what? Miami coaches have to get Shakuri Brown ready now. You don't want to wait until <laughs> he needs to be competing to start next spring. And so when you watch Shakuri Brown, for instance, just to give a small example of sort of what coaches have to deal with. Um, so just in, in just even initial drills, whatever it is, you know, you take a snap gun, snap gun you're, you're in the shotgun, you take the snap. And every time Shakuri Brown takes a snap, I don't know if you've watched Gary's film on it, but he spins the ball in his hand as soon as he gets the snap. It's just a habit that he has from high school. And in high school, you can get away with that. You know, he sort of spins it and finds the laces instead of just grabbing it and throwing it. It's quick release. So, he, you know, these are just small, aside from the footwork and everything, like that's just a small example of things that coaches have to fix. And that's a, that's a, a habit. That's a habit he's had, probably had for years. It's probably a habit that's very hard to break, that he's very comfortable spinning the ball in his hands to get the right grip. And, um, you know, just, the, just those little things that these kids have to each work on that fans don't see, like that's just a small example of that, you know, that these coaches constantly practice in, practice out. It's not just a depth chart and figuring out who should start. It's correcting, you know, habits that have been formed over years of kids who come in and then making sure they um, reinforce the correct habits every single practice. And then you can start saying, hey, maybe this guy is better than that guy or whatever it is. But there's a lot of work these coaches that each of these players has to do. It's not just about, you know, who's going to be first team tomorrow. All right. Uh, so, yeah, we'll have lots to cover to spring practice resuming this morning. Uh, you know, so be watching the website uh, late morning. Their, their practices are going to be start uh, about an hour earlier, it looks like, for the rest of the spring than they have been. So uh, late morning, you should start seeing the bunch of coverage popping on the website of spring practice. Um, all right. Um, moving on um, a little more f- football this morning we got a couple recruiting stories on 2023 prospects um the first one is cornerback uh Dewan johnson from tampa and this is a name that i remember this is a kid that's moving up the charts I believe he's the most of the services rank him a three-star right now but that's going to change he's getting offers matt from all the top schools in the country alabama georgia miami uh on and on and on and on uh, I think it's a good sign, and uh, you can read the story and get all the all the details about it. But uh, I think it's a good sign that he's coming, planning on coming to Miami back to back weekends uh, for multiple visits. That means that uh, the coaches on the defensive side of the ball are doing a real good job recruiting him. Yeah, and you know everyone makes a big deal. Miami lost a four star commit, Andy Jean. They have a couple of three star commits. It's so early, man. And this kid's a three star, but like you said, I think he's his offer. To me, offers speak way louder than stars. And this kid has offers from tons of top programs. Likes Miami a lot. He's going to be around the program twice in the next couple of weeks. And if those visits go well, I think there's a really good chance that Miami gets him. So, um, you know, you can't ask for anything more than that. All right. There's also a story on the side about uh, 2023 linebacker Duran Gallette from uh, Marlin, Texas. Um, Miami was his 17th offer. Another kid that's getting a lot of interest from a lot of different schools. He will be visiting um and likes the things that the coaching staff has been saying and and um you know obviously miami continues to expand its presence in the state of texas yeah you know it's it's funny so you know we call recruits all the time so i i did talk to one recruit i don't want to single him out i don't even want to say if he has a top 10 or top 12 but it was one of these top lists that he tweeted out in the last uh week or two and so i called him and i said you know i saw miami made your top list you know i was just curious you know sort of started talking to him why miami made the list and da, 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 da. and um you know this is very typical of recruits and it's something that fans maybe would get angry about but don't understand but it's not just this kid it's a it's a common trend he hasn't talked to miami he hasn't talked to the miami cat he hasn't he has not i can't even speak i'm so uh <laughs> aghast he has not spoken to the miami coaching staff the new coaches once so you know well, why'd you put miami on your Top 10, top 12 list. Oh, because it's Miami. Why not? <laughs> That's what he told me. I'm not writing a story on it. I said, oh, okay, you know, well, if you hear from Miami coaches, you know, let me know, shoot me a text, whatever. But I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Does that mean that Miami's back in the sense that kids, you know, it's in vogue to have Miami on your favorites list, even if you've yeah. never talked to the coaches once? I'm seeing that a lot this cycle. I've seen it several cases. Well, maybe it's a good thing. I see I some know. of the, <laughs> the, the national recruiting analysts falling victim to that and, and putting out these stories saying that these kids are considering Miami who aren't even really seriously being recruited, recruited by Miami. And, um, you know, it's a hard task for them because, they, you know, they're just talking to the kids and going by what the kids are telling them. They obviously aren't as close to the situation as, say, 
you know, we would be. Um, but I'm seeing that from a lot of kids right now, kids saying that they're, you know, considering certain schools that aren't even seriously recruiting them. And, you know, the onus is on us to figure out who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth. And when you're recruiting as many kids as this staff is recruiting, um, it's a big task. And uh, that's why we're increasing our staff this summer, <laughs> because, uh, they, you know, we need it. We need more manpower to be able to, 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 to do it all right. And, uh, you know, big, big things coming forward for Kane Sport this summer. Uh, we'll be making all those announcements later. All right. Um, actually, before we go forward, um, let's hear from our friends at Life Wallet. And because the baseball team won two out of three at Clemson this weekend, right down the road from where the basketball team was putting on a show at Greenville, um, let's hear from Life Wallet Baseball. My name is Yohan Morales, and I am Life Wallet. Hey, yo, yo. Heads up. I strike out all my hitters, but I want everyone to knock it out of the park with Life Wallet. Life Wallet could save my life, and it could save yours too. Life Wallet, saving time, saving lives. The video editor was a little bit off on the swing. He needed to clip a little bit more um, tape, I thought. But you know, interesting commercial. No comment, Matt Chido. <laughs> I, just want, I just want to know how many lives Life Wallet has sold. I want them to have like a ticker. I want a ticker on the commercials. How many lives they have every minute? How many they've gotten since they started running these commercials? Uh, I'd be curious to know that too. I'll fast John Ruiz. Um, all right. Uh, so let's move on to baseball since we just showed the commercial. I, I mentioned that they won two out of three at Clemson. Um, our trusted intern, Cal Friedman, was there for the entire series. Uh, he and I were texting. I mean, he, he wanted to get into March Madness and 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 have a chance to see the NCAA tournament, but he had to uh, call the uh, baseball games for the student uh, radio station. Um, he brings an analysis to us today, uh, looking at all the positives, Matt, for Canes baseball, beating a pr pretty good Clemson team two out of three. Yeah, Cal reminds me of a young Gary Furman. Just very, <laughs> very positive about everything. Nothing negative, you know. He, I, I, you know, I'm the editor, managing editor, or whatever. So you know, I read Cal's stories when they come in, and Cal does a great job. He's, a, he's a really good young writer. Okay, and I think he wants to be a broadcast journalist, which is fine. Not everybody has the face for broadcast journalism like Cal does. Okay, I certainly don't. You can speak for yourself. But he sends me this story, <laughs> and the, the version he sent me. <clears throat> He didn't, he didn't want to mention the score of the third game, you know. <laughs> he didn't want to mention they lost 20 to 5. He just wanted to focus on the first two games. So I had to sort of massage it a little bit, Cal. I'm sorry. I had to put in that they lost the third game, Cal. I apologize. You know, I know they won the first two, and it was all great and everything. I, I know you're a UM student intern, and, and you know, you're looking, you're looking at the positives like Gary Furman does. But Mr. Shodell had to put the negatives in there. Sorry, okay, man. But I was right, Matt. I mean, I was right about basketball. I've been saying it the entire season. You were listen. You and I were on the same page from the midway point of the season. What you get kudos for, and I and I predicted them going to the Sweet Sixteen. By the way, I literally you can go back and look before the tournament started. That's my bracket. But what I gives you kudos for is before the season, you were saying how amazing they were going to be, how exciting they were going to be, and then they stunk for the first month of the season, and you stopped talking about it. But now that they're winning again, it's like, no. oh, I said it all along. No, I didn't stop I talking about it. No, no, I did not stop talking about it. I said there was an adjustment period that was going to take place. Uh -huh. I mean, you're bringing guys from all over the place and putting them together and throwing them out on a court and saying, be a team. And it wasn't going to happen like that. I mean, but look at all the adjustments that were made along the way with, with by going 100% to the scramble defense, yep. uh, putting in an entirely new offense. Uh, I mean, what a coaching job this has been, Matt. I mean, it really, it really has been. Um, but you know, um, but getting back to Cal and baseball, these kids that are on, on campus right now as communication students, I get a real kick out of them. Um, there's a group of them. There's Cal. He's got this friend Luke, and there's uh, one or two other guys. Like every single baseball game to these guys, every single basketball game to these guys is like the NBA championship and the World Series. And it is the coolest thing to watch. Like they, they, they have so much well, uh, yeah. useful excitement and uh, well, uh, about it. Like they get on Twitter, they'll get on Twitter at one o'clock in the morning and do like these chats on Twitter. It's it, you know, it, it's the funniest, funniest thing. And well, I mean, one of the it's, look, the random fan out there is not going to understand this, but 
one of the hardest things for a student intern, we've had a lot of them. One of them is a Dolphins beat writer now for the Sun Sentinel, who, who was our student intern for a couple of years. But one of the hardest things for these student interns to learn is that you have to separate being a fan of the school you attend and writing your stories. Now, if it's an editorial and you want to put some positive vibes in there, which Cal did, that's 100% fine. But if you're writing an actual game story um, or a feature, you know, you can't be, you can't have too many plaudits and accolades and, and laud everybody like they're, you know, the second coming of Michael Jordan. You have to treat them like you're impartial. That's just the job of a reporter. And uh, like I've had interns show up. I've, I literally have to tell the interns when, I, when we hire them. I say, listen, do not wear any logo of any school, including the University of Miami, to a practice or a game. No professional logo. Not like you want to wear an Adidas or a Nike, fine, but you can't show up at a game with a USC hat. You can't show up to a Miami game with a, even a Miami shirt. You can't show any bias. A reporter's job is to be unbiased and give you guys out there the straight up news. And you know, there's a lot of fan sites out there where they're just fans that are running sites, which is fine. You know, um, some fans actually like to only hear the positives, which is why I don't have a lot of people that like me. <laughs> um, which is fine too. You know, I don't mind being being hated. Um, I know what it feels like uh, to be some of these past Miami Hurricane coaches in some cases. Uh, but but the, the point is, you know, we've had people from other schools come into Miami and cheer in the press box. You get you get kicked out of the press box if you cheer for a play. It, it's not allowed. It, 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 not only is it frowned upon, it's not. It's literally not allowed. You can't yeah. be a fan. That's the whole point of being a journalist. So yeah, you know, was- it takes a little while for some of these kids to learn that. I'll I'll plead guilty. Like yesterday in Greenville, like oh boy, no, I was I was into that Auburn game a little bit. There were like it, which team were which team were you rooting for? Oh, I mean, obvious, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but like I, it's like I just I love these kids, man. Like they they're a really good group of kids, and they're really yeah, you know, they're yeah. doing okay. they're doing so well. And the coach basketball, they, here's the difference: basketball and baseball players love to talk to us. Football players, they know they're, like, way above us. Like, what do I need to talk to you for? I'm going to be making millions of dollars in a few years. Like, why am I wasting my 10 minutes with you right now? I could be eating some food in the mess hall. Yeah, or whatever I, you I, call it. The, the training table. Mess hall. I don't know. I guess I'm in the Army still. I think um, I said it on the show last night from the arena. But, like, there was a lot of media covering that regional. And uh, they were absolutely mesmerized by Miami's press conferences at, at the way the kids were handling themselves and – um, how smart they were and, and the way they were describing their schemes and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it was very noticeable. And this was reporters that were there covering other schools. I mean, you know, Miami didn't have reporters at the regional. It was I mean, me and Michelle Kaufman. We were the Miami media contingent in Greenville. Um, but yeah, the, it, I mean, it, it was just nice to see other people recognize how well these kids did. And, um, you know, it's a credit to the program. And uh, speaking of which, Matt, um, of the program. Uh, another story on the website today, uh, we talked to Christian Watson, who's, uh, I don't know if you guys out there have had a chance, you know, I, I mean, I know we're, we're sort of trying to like corral everybody into being basketball fans uh, because the program need, you know, can use that support and deserves that support. Um, but this kid is going to be a really good player at Miami. If you, if you turn on his tape and, and I, I think we have a highlight film in the story that's on the website today, Watch this kid's game, man. This kid is like the next can. He, he looked. He reminds me of Cam Magusti. Magusti. Let me get, get. God, man, I gotta break myself of that habit, Matt. Um, Mag, Cam Magusti. He reminds me of Cam Magusti. If I say it enough times, I will stop mispronouncing it. Um, but uh, no, very well-rounded game. This Christian Watson kid, and and he'll be a big piece next year. And uh, we so we talked to him a little bit about you know, what, what he thought of what he was seeing from the program and, and, and how they're doing. And um, it's an interesting story. And I encourage everybody uh, to take a look at it today. And we'll, you know, we'll be checking in this week with as many of those recruits uh, that, that are coming in and see what they think. Because Matt, as much as this is a celebration of the present, and when you get to the Sweet 16 with an opportunity to go to the Elite Eight, maybe even the Final Four, if you could pull off one big magical upset if you can get to that let that game on sunday against the kansas possibly and and give yourself one more shot to to shock the world um coach l did it at george mason you know uh it's not impossible um with all the 
obvious excitement of what's going on right now this week and last week. Uh, this is also, I think you got to remember, this is a first step back for Miami. I mean, Miami was here a few years ago. They went to the tournament three straight years. They were backing up team after team after team. They were recruiting great. They had three NBA players on board as recruits that they were probably going to get. And then, boom, the FBI totally derailed the basketball program. And um, so getting back this year, to me, Matt, this is this is step one. I mean, th- this is not the, fi- the final destination. Coach L has signed on to coach for four more years. Hopefully he can fulfill that, uh, stays healthy and 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 uh, moves forward and fulfills that. He certainly has that intention. Um, but this is a step one, and it's about as much these kids going moving forward. I mean, they're, they're going to have some other off-season challenges. They, it looks like Jordan Miller will come back, but they got to solidify that. Um, they got to try to get. Uh, hopefully, somebody uh, offers Isaiah Wong a good enough NIL deal. Uh, to get him to come back and just finish rounding out his game so that maybe he can get drafted into the NBA um, and not have to, like, say, go to Europe or the G League or something and 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 try to earn his stripes there. Um, maybe he could be convinced for a, yet another year at Miami where he would come back and probably be one of the better players in the country next year, I would think, um, as a fourth-year player. Uh, so, you know, we'll see what happens there. But, Matt, the bottom line of what I'm talking about here is – this is a beginning. This isn't an end for Miami here in the NCAA tournament. Well, I don't disagree with anything you said during your 25-minute soliloquy there. Um, I would just add yeah. I would add that I wouldn't worry about Cam Magusti because he calls you Jerry Furman. So, I mean, I think it's <laughs> Magusti, not a big deal. Magusti, Magusti. I got it. I got it now. Not a big deal either way. And then, um, you know, again, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I would just add, you know, <laughs> I like this Christian Watson kid. You know, I, I haven't had time. I talked to another one of the signees um, last night. And I haven't had time to type it up yet. But, you know, Christian Watson just flat out tells, you know, what's your bracket, Christian? I have Miami just going to the Final Four. You know, that's what he has. <laughs> Final Four. And you think that's great, right? I'm like, wow, you know, that's amazing, right? And then I talked to the next one. And he's like, of course I picked Miami to win the national championship. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> you know, you have to. So I'm like, ooh, that's not so good for Christian Watson anymore. The fans aren't going to like this one now. But, you know, it is what it is. Christian Watson was honest. He's trying to. Christian Watson's trying to win his bracket. The other kid will type up. He's just, you know, he's he's got the moral fiber to just go with what, you know, he knows he should do. <laughs> he knows Miami's not going to win the national championship. I don't think Miami's going to win the national championship, okay? Maybe some fans out there do. I personally think they'll be very lucky to get past Kansas. I think Kansas is going to beat Providence. But uh, I, I do think Miami will beat Iowa State. But, um, you know, that's just me. Yeah, I like the Miami-Iowa State matchup, too. Um, very similar teams. I think Miami's got a little more offense uh, to turn to uh, on Friday night. And um, I'm sure that they'll come with a good game plan, as they always do. And uh, I like Miami's chances on Friday night. I hope it works out. All right, we'll be talking about that all all week. I think um, you know we've talked enough for today. Uh, we thank you guys for waking up with us and joining us on Good Morning Cane Sport. Uh, have a great day. Be on the website late this morning. We'll be pounding you with coverage from um, the second week after a spring break of uh, spring practice, which is going to, like I said, it, this is to me where it really begins. Uh, you're going to be in full pads, a lot of intense work, a lot of contact. Mario Cristobal does not believe in soft spring practice. Uh, so for Matt Chodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow, everybody.